Welcome to Econ Roots, your podcast on the roots of economic thought. I'm Stefan. And I'm Otto. Let's get on with today's conversation. So, welcome to the second episode. Today, we are starting on the advent of modern macro. Are you excited, Otto? Quite so. That's Quite good. So. So uh, we call this the advent because uh, the three uh, main stars of today is going to be Samuelson, it's going to be Hayek, and it's going to be Friedman. Those are the ones we're going to do bios on. But in order to understand the contribution, I think we're going to have to go a little bit back. So uh, so what's at stake here? What is macro? And why do we call it the advent of modern macro? Quite a lot is at stake here. It has been... Perhaps it's the newest part of economic theory or some of the, the, the newer parts of economic theory, but it's become very important and very, um, not only as a theoretical discipline, but uh, also in economic policy. And the question in macroeconomics really is, uh, why do we have a business cycle? Why isn't... Uh, the employment, unemployment, um, the price level, the production, why isn't it uh, stable or growing at a steady rate over time? Why do we see cycles? Um, and the, of course, uh, people have noticed this for a long time, but especially in the 1930s, we had the Great Depression, and that set off a number of... Uh, important contributions, uh, which are important for understanding uh, our main figures today. Actually, one of our main figures was also a main figure already in the 1930s, uh, Hayek. Um, Hayek, who was uh, with Ludwig von Mises, uh, were uh, the part of the so-called Austrian school and developed the Austrian school approach to uh, macroeconomics, to the business cycle. And uh, other contributions were, there was the, the Stockholm School, which was um, uh, especially the Swedish economist Excel. And last but not least, there was John Maynard Keynes, who uh, uh, developed what uh, is now Known as Keynesianism in in in, in macroeconomics. So these these were the three uh, uh, dominant uh, ideas at the time, and uh, as we see today, they that was quite important for for what the uh, Nobel laureates have done ever since. Exactly, and uh, to those stains among you, uh, if you're interested in Keynes, he's in the first season because he actually dies in '46. So a lot of what we call Keynesianism today is done by his students. Uh, the premier one, I suppose we could call him, Sam Wilson is actually one of our stars today. Um, but Hayek was a contemporary of Keynes, so Hayek actually he, he gets to win the prize, but he actually was part of the debate back then, which is exactly. fascinating. Yeah. Cool. Well, this is really interesting. So let's let's jump into to Samuelson. So what I'll do, dear listeners, is I'll I'll give you a short bio on him and then tell a little bit about how he got the prize, and then we'll start discussing what he's trying to tell us. Um, and also, of course, you just jump in whenever you feel like it or whatever, right? So, so uh, Paul Anthony Samuelson was born on the fifth of May, uh, 1915, and he died on December 30th, 13th, sorry, 2009. Um, he was of recent Polish descent. He was born in Gary, Indiana. His father was a pharmacist, and you might speculate that that impacted his view of economics, the idea that it was a body that you could actually uh, solve or at least ease the pain with the right kind of medication, right? Um, at least I always thought that. Uh, he started at the University of Chicago at the age of 16 during the Great Depression. He got a PhD from Harvard um, and um, he joined MIT at the age of 25, became a full professor already at the age of 32. Very impressive. And he basically stayed at MIT his whole career and he built their economic faculty, uh, including attracting many uh, later nor- uh, laureates to it. It's interesting because are you aware that Samuelson actually pinpoints the precise time he was born as an economist? No, actually not. It's quite interesting. He actually said that he was born as an economist at 8 a.m. 
on January 2nd, 1932. And I was at the University of Chicago classroom in a lecture on the British economist Thomas Malthus, who, uh, to those listeners who might not know, he studied populations and 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 uh, and growth and so on. And basically, Samuelson felt there was a dissonance between neoclassical economics at the time and the real world. Right? You remember that old Reagan joke about economists, Otto? About the the one with the with the hands. No, I think about the one that an, eco- an economist is somebody who sees something that works in theory. Uh, it works in reality and wonders, does this work in theory? <laughs> <laughs> I think Sam Wilson might have thought, of a, thought a little bit about yeah. this. But besides that, he was actually, um, his teachers uh, were what we would consider pretty free market people at the time. Henry Simmons, Frank Knight was big influences on him. Uh, however, when he went to Harvard, uh, he also had many, uh, many great teachers, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, uh, Vasily Leontief, Gottfried Haberler, uh, and the American Keynes, Alvin Hansen, right? Mm-hmm. So um, um, he uh, he advised uh, um, GFK and uh, and President Lyndon Johnson. No, sorry, he was was he sorry he was president, right? Yes, yes, sorry, yes, yes sir, sorry. Not being an American here, I was a little bit uh, confused. Uh, yes. And he also served in the, after Kennedy was shot. Oh yeah, so. that is true. That is true. Sorry to the Americans out there. Sorry about that. So uh, he also consulted for various federal institutions like the Treasury and so on. And most famously, possibly, is that he uh, partook in some very famous debates with with uh, Friedman um, in Newsweek. They had a weekly column each. Uh, Samuels described himself as a cafeteria Keynesian, um, where and they debated various topics in these. And uh, I think that contributed a lot to the school view. But we can also talk a little bit about his textbook later on. I think Samuels and probably contributed a lot to the idea that there was different schools within economic fund. Um, but we can talk a little bit about that. That would be interesting to return to in a moment. Um, as a fun story, uh, the famous scientist is Stanislav Ulam. He was a nuclear scientist who helped create the nuclear bomb. He invented Monte Carlo simulation, all that great stuff. He once asked Samuelson if there was some uh, observation or fact or theory in social sciences, all of them, which were both... Um, uh, considered uh, true and non-trivial. And apparently Sam Wilson's reply after uh, a while was that um, that would be the the um, theory you have from David Ricardo about competitive advantage. He said that doesn't need to be explained. Uh, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll read this direct quote. It is logically true, need not be argued before a mathematician, that it is not trivial is attested by the thousands of important and intelligent men who have never been able to grasp the doctrine for themselves or to believe it after it was explained to them. Very impressive. Um, when he died, uh, Susan Hockfield, who was president at MIT at the si- time, said that he basically transformed everything he touched, the theoretical foundation of his field, the way economics were taught around the world, the ethos and stature of his department, and the investment practices of MIT and uh, the lives of his colleagues and students. And that's a great segment over to how he got the prize because he actually got the second prize ever awarded. He got it in 1970. And he got it for, and I'll read the motivation here, the scientific work through which Samuelson has developed static and dynamic economic theory and actively contributed to raising the level of analysis in economic science. And uh, before we start discussing his um, uh, his contributions, uh, I, I'm such a big, I have to talk about his, his uh, award speech uh, it's it's such an impressive read. It's pr- pretty short, and we link to it in the show notes. But it's such an impressive speech. So in it, Samuelson gives five ways, five things that has to be in place in order to win the Nobel Prize. Right? Five things. Okay. So the first thing, he'll quote directly. The first thing you must do is to have great teachers. For the sake of the economists present here, let me uh, do some name dropping concerning my own good fortune in this regard. If you have had Jakob Werner and Frank Knight and Paul Douglas as teachers and then went on to be blessed by having Josef Schumpeter, Vasily Leontief, Gottfried Haberler and Alvin Hansen, then you have had the uh, one necessary condition for the problem. So uh, uh, that that is pretty impressive, but it actually goes on because the next tip is you need good colleagues. Two of the ones he mentioned in that segment later on win the prize. Uh, he says the third thing is you need good students. Three of those won the prize. <laughs> And finally, you need to read the classics. And of the classic, he mentions two of them won the Nobel Prize. 
And the fifth thing is luck, but whatever. <laughs> I think it's, it's such a such a name dropping list. That's quite impressive. So Arthur, um, what is it that Samuelson's trying to do? Well, um, Samuelson is trying to uh, clarify uh, the thoughts uh, in Keynes' uh, general theory. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, uh, as we discussed, there was these three uh, approaches, the Austrian, the Stockholm, and the Keynesian approach. And Samuelson is the one who's uh, his primary uh, driver of uh, writing what we today would call a model <laughs> or a model, which is uh, a mathematical representation of the entire system. Um, and Keynes didn't do that. So even if we talk about Keynesian models a lot today, uh, Keynes he didn't write a, a model and he, he wrote about a lot of ideas and how they connected, but he didn't do it in a in a in a rigorous uh, way, uh, and that was what uh, uh, Saint Wilson did. He 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 set out to 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 present the entire system uh, in, in the entire Keynesian model in in a systematic way. So that was that was his main contribution and and. Uh, you already alluded uh, to that. Um, that uh, it was mentioned uh, in, in, in recognizing him as a as a Nobel laureate. And why would we need a model for economics? Like, what what's the idea here, right? Why why is that an improvement to the science? Well, it's it, it's not necessarily an improvement. <laughs> well, well, according to Sam, uh, at least, right? Uh, or always an improvement but it has shown to be very important to understand the entirety of the ideas and the consistency of the ideas uh, so the idea is when you write out a model you describe all the important mechanisms uh, in, in the ideas uh, rather like the uh, in, we do in physics. Mm -hmm. In physics, you would also describe uh, a system by a number of equations. Uh, for instance, if uh, you want to 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 describe the, the solar system, you can do that by a number of, uh, of equations, uh, which Newton did. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, um, that's what Samuelson is doing with the, the Keynesian approach. Um, and just to to mention the core idea uh, of of the the Keynesian approach, um, the the core idea of the Keynesian approach, and this is used by, uh, of course, by Samuelson and later Keynesians, is that the price system is uh, not doing its magic. Um, Hayek called called the the, the price system a marvel uh, because the price system is the is, is a, commun a communication system um, which uh, produces what Hayek called a spontaneous order um, in the way that we are all economic agents and we have plans we want to to realize but how how does your plans fit in with my plans and a lot of other individuals well the the key concept here is the price system. Um, when we act, it affect it uh, it affects the prices, which then works as signals. So, if your price system is working uh, perfectly, uh, you have what is called Say's law. Say's law says that uh, supply uh, uh, supply always equals demand or any supply will create its own demands to be more precise. But but the idea is that uh, if prices work, supply and demand uh, will always be the same. All markets will clear. If all markets clear, you you would you would have ma macroeconomic stability. Um, you, for instance, 
the labor market, if the labor market clears, then you would have, uh, you wouldn't see unemployment going up and down. So when we see the business cycle, uh, in, in Keynes' uh, view, something was uh, wrong, especially with the, and a very important price, the wages. So, so Keynes' idea was that, that especially wages were stiff. So if demand changed, instead of, uh, of setting a coordination in, um, in place by the, by, by the price system, um, a shift in demand could have effect on the supply side in the sense that uh, that supply and demand wouldn't be uh, be the same anymore. So uh, that that was the the sort of main main idea uh, that that prices are not doing their work uh, sufficiently. This is also the idea actually in the other contributions we're going to talk about today. So the idea that price the price system is not working uh, instantaneously is sort of at the core of, uh, of uh, macroeconomics after, actually for, for, for after the, uh, the, the 1930s and, and even until today. I think that's a very interesting uh, way of framing it. This is exactly why, because Samuelson believed that mathematics was the natural language of economics because it was so precise and you could do these models and yep. so on. But here I also think that his potential pharma, uh, uh, pharmacist father plays in, right? Because a ma mathematical model is very easy to fix. Like you can see what's wrong, basically, right? Whereas, uh, I don't think Hayek, Hayek comments a lot on that, which we'll get to later. But, I mean, the question is whether people believe behaves as equations, right? Like, and, and Samuelson do have to make some pretty hard assumptions, right? In, in many of it, right? For instance, yes. utility maximization. He's, he's very big on that as far as I remember, right? Like you will always maximize utility if possible, right? Well, yes, he has that, but actually the, the idea that you could describe the macroeconomic system without a specific reference to individual agents mm, uh, point. was, was uh, very important uh, to to, to Samuelson, later economists have uh, criticized that uh, that assumption, saying that you you need to understand individual uh, action in if you want to, uh, to to describe the the, the macroeconomic system. But but some economists think that uh, that you can describe the laws of the macro uh, economy distinct from, from individuals. And, and certainly um, Samuelson's way of thinking was, uh, was, uh, was a reason for that. Um, Samuelson makes an immense amount of contributions to economics. We cannot downplay it. And I think one of the reasons why he does so is also because he's the author of, um, of uh, basically what took over as the main textbook after Marshall's principles, right? And that that is the uh, has his uh, his economics uh, textbook and introduction analysis it was called, which is sold mm -hmm. over uh, four million. It's translated to forty languages, right? Um, it is actually since nineteen eighty five co-authored with another Nobel laureate, uh, Nordhaus. Um, Let's talk a little bit about that book. Have you, did you read it when you uh, did your uh, graduate studies? No, no, <laughs> no. I, did, I didn't. Uh, it, uh, it, it it wasn't used uh, in in economics at, at my time. Uh, it was used uh, actually the law students in Copenhagen where I studied. Oh, really? They That's they funny. they were required uh, much against their will <laughs> to study some economics, <laughs> and they used uh, Samuelson's. Oh, interesting. Book. Um, yeah, um, it's an interesting book. It's it's it's, def it's very it's very Keynesian, but it's also like open for certain free market ideas. And this is another thing we could maybe talk about because yeah, many of his teachers weren't Keynesian. They were very free market. Like he started at Chicago, and you know, Frank Knight is definitely a free market guy, right? And and so on. So how how do you go? Do you think also spend like when we think back to what happens in the thirties? Why does he become Keynesian? Well, I think. Uh, Keynes sort of won the day mm -hmm. uh, after the the, 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 the 
the great debate in in the 1930s. Uh, Keynes was seen as, as as winning the winning the debate on on the macro economy. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about Hayek, who was uh, the most uh, direct ad adversary to, to to Keynes in the 1930s. Hayek went on to do other things, mm, so true. sort of left the macroeconomics yeah. uh, uh, scene uh, after the Second World War. Uh, so, so after the war, it was widely recognized that uh, Keynes had explained. The, the the great theory uh, or the great recession, uh, great depression. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> great depression in 1930s. That um, what the and the, the reason was that there was insufficient uh, demand, and that government could uh, could fix the uh, uh, the. the uh, could fix the microeconomy if it was uh, out of equilibrium by uh, in increasing or decreasing demand. So the idea was that if there was insufficient demand, government could uh, could spend more than it taxed. Basically, uh, by fiscal policy, uh, could could increase demand. Um, so even if prices were wrong for the, the given demand you would uh, you could you could uh, fix the prices indirectly by fixing uh, demand instead um, so sounds like so such an appealing idea out. yes <laughs> and vice versa if 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 there was too much demand um, then you would uh, run into inflation and um, the way to if, if it didn't like inflation, you could you could uh, decrease the demand until the inflation stops. Inflation is not kind of really say the price system is not working, but it's it's increasing all prices, and for many reasons that 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 can be a bad thing. So so basically, the idea was that uh, society would either suffer from too little or too much. Demand and government should compensate for that by either uh, increasing or decreasing demand by fiscal policy. So there is no doubt in my mind that we should respect Samuelson. He was a great sc scholar. And in the show notes, we'll leave a list of the many contributions he's made. Uh, uh, but um, there's something called the Soviet love affair, we sometimes call it. And uh, maybe he got a little too, in, too into that idea, right? Because on the textbook, you remember the, uh, the the front page of that one? The whole idea about the Soviet overtaking the US and so on. Uh, um, so um, basically the idea was that uh, uh, right up until I think it was the 85 edition or something like that, he kept uh, he kept uh, making the claim that the Soviet would outdo the uh, output of the U.S. Right? Wasn't it like this? Yeah. And um, uh, Otto's nodding. You guys can't see that, but he's nodding. <laughs> 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 Which is, of course, easy to make fun of nowadays. But uh, you know, if you if you're rigorous with your theory, I mean, you have to to go where it takes you. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know if it was a love affair. It was. Uh, Many many people thought that uh, that the Soviets would overtake the the West, uh, and uh, you can see the same thing today mm -hmm. with the Chinese. As oh, yeah. the same talk about the Chinese taking over, uh, and of course they are growing faster than 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 the West. And if you keep on growing faster, <laughs> then. At some point, you will overtake. Oh yeah, that's a simple <laughs> law of mathematics. But uh, because you're dr driving faster right now, doesn't mean that you will do it forever. Oh, and so so um, you might run out of gas. You might run out of gas, and um, and per perhaps you're not really driving as fast as as, as people think. And I think that yeah. was the case for the for the Soviet Union. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, we're going to talk a lot about institutions and growth and so on in coming episodes because there's lots of contributions there. But I think uh, maybe Samuelson's success 
made him also a little bit close to uh, to other explanations for for what he was arguing. Right, that's the this, there's many advantages to modeling. It's clear to argue. It's clear mm. to to uh, also critique and all these things. But of course, it also a model is always a simplification of the world and. And obviously, that that can leave out other explanatory factors. Exactly. Right? That's, but that's exactly. the curse of social science. Yes. Cool. Um, should we talk about the Phillips curve bef- because we're going to return to that later, or should we should we just introduce Friedman before doing that, or what do you think? We I think mean? it's a good idea to, to to talk about the Phillips curve. Let's talk uh, a little bit about the Phillips curve before we go to the name next after story. a New Zealander. Yeah. Um, called Phillips, uh, uh, who. Basically, didn't do a lot of work in this area, but he very early on uh, discovered that there was a seemingly stable correlation between uh, the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. Hmm. So it seems that that uh, you could either have a low inflation and high unemployment. Or vice versa. So there seemed to be a negative relationship, and this fit very well with the uh, with the Samuelson Keynesian model. Um, so ba- basically, you you would um, have to there was this trade off, and you would have to to decide um, whether you wanted to to uh, to to have high inflation or high unemployment or a mix mixture of the two. Of course, what was the idea was that you should you should influence demand in in order to 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 make the labor market uh, clear and um, uh, by by the right dose of of demand. Um, so the the Phillips curve became very popular uh, as a tool in 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 understanding Keynesianism. What sort of an expression of the central mechanism, or, and the idea that something was uh, could could be wrong with the price system, uh, especially the wages, the, the the wages. So, so if wages are stiff, um, and you suddenly you see uh, inflation is low, then real low, uh, wages will start to to, to increase, and you will get unemployment. Vice versa. If you, um, if if inflation is is is, is high and and real uh, and and the uh, unemployment rate wages are, are lacking behind, then real wages will fall and uh, more labor will be demanded. Mm-hmm. And uh, with the economy presented like such a trade-off. Populist politicians and large-scale redistributive states that we see arising in the 1970s, you really see the explanation for, well, the Keynesian 20th century, right? I mean, these these things sort of went together in in a mix, right? Uh, uh, this economic theory sort of gave explanation tools to that politicians then used for their own ends, as they always do, right? And uh, um, and that's a really really fascinating part to understand about the intellectual history of the 20th century, I think. Uh, so. But um, let's let's move on because we already talked so much. But uh, we'll probably return to some of these points. So um, let's talk a little bit about Hayek before we get to Friedman, and then we will turn to Friedman and probably the Phillips curve in the end. Yes. So, yeah. So um, Hayek was um, uh, here. We go. <laughs> Sorry. So Hayek got the prize in 1974. He uh, he shared it with uh, Gonomure was actually one of the inspirations for Samuelson's as well. They w- were not in agreement about many things. They are an example of people who got it for opposite contributions, so to speak, uh, were important. The prize motivation was for their pioneering work in the theory of money and economic fl- fl- fluctuations and for their penetrating analysis of the interdependence of economic, social, and institutional phenomena. Um, Hayek was the first non-Keynesian to win the prize, actually. That's at least the, uh, the claim to it. It is, of course, a matter of degree. Um, in the first episode of this season, we talked about his critique of the price, uh, the very famous Hayek critique. Uh, but if we look a little bit into his uh, his life, um, 
So Hayek uh, was born Friedrich August von Hayek. He was born in the Habsburg Empire, and he was born on the 8th of May, 1899, and he died the 23rd of March, uh, 1992. Uh, Hayek is an interesting person because he sort of lived the 20th century, and you feel like if you read his bio, Hayek on Hayek, you can really feel how he, he experienced maybe mm-hmm. the, the mo- one of the most tumur- tumultuous uh, centuries in uh, in human time, and, and also a century just saw the life of everyday people change extremely uh, much, especially in the kind of place where he was from originally. Uh, he also joked apparently that when he was young, uh, only old people agreed with him, and when he was old, only young people agreed with him, <laughs> which I think is a, is a fun, fun way. His uh, father was a medical doctor. His uh, grandparents were actually scientists. Uh, they were, um, uh, one of them was a physicist. And he was relate, uh, related to Ludwig Wittgenstein, actually. So, uh, um, I think they were cousins. Yeah, they were cousins, exactly. Um, he was a very poor student, apparently. Like, he didn't do well in any subjects whatsoever, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> However, uh, he got to serve in the First World War and he was awarded medals for bravery. And part of his later contributions with, um, uh, with the Spontaneous Order, he apparently got to think about when uh, when he was at the front, the Italian front, and order broke down, the Habsburg Empire disappeared within a week. It's an amazing story to think about this 400-year-old social structure just disappearing. Uh, and then, you know, you should think everything descending into chaos and anarchy, but it didn't. Somehow people made it work and they found solutions and they got on with their lives under the new conditions and, and he thought that was very interesting. Uh, he got a doctoral degree from the University of Vienna in law in 1921 and in uh, political science in 1933. He went into some student group of Ludwig von Mises, one of the key Austrians. He lived and worked uh, during his life in Austria, UK, US, and Germany. Academically, he was at the London School of Economics, Chicago, and Freiburg. He wasn't part of the economics department at Chicago, though. They didn't want him at that time. They thought he was too much of a philosopher, I think the story was, right? Um, um, and uh, he was friends with Keynes, but as you already said, uh, where we opposed on on the idea of economic policy, um, and uh, that's a whole uh, whole subject of itself. Um, their relation. He was good friends with Karl Popper, the uh, 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 the theorist Karl Popper, whose work is very very well known. He actually managed to write a bestseller. His most famous book, The Road to Serfdom, sold 2.25 million copies worldwide. It's very impressive. It's a good book. He uh, he advised Thatcher and others, uh, uh, like Reagan and others, but he was very critical of conservatism. He was a classical liberal, a Whig, he called himself. Um, so um, that's Hayek. So what is it that Hayek is? So Hayek got the prize for work he wasn't really doing anymore. Like when he was doing his work on macro, he was basically mainstream because it was before the Second World War. He was giving some lectures and prize and production in the London School of Economics. And then after the Second World War, he was basically heterodoxy, right? Like he, yes. yeah. Uh, but he still managed to get the prize. Why do you think that is? Well, I don't think that's strange at all. Uh, he made an important contribution um, to, to macroeconomic theory or, or the theory of the business cycle already in the 30s mm-hmm. and unlike Keynes he was still alive mm-hmm. uh, to, to get the prize uh, so 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 he got he, he got it for that but he also as we discussed moved on to other things mm-hmm. and did important work in other areas of economics as well as uh, in political theory and social theory in general so he covered a lot of areas uh, oh yeah and for that reason, I think we're going to to discuss uh, Hayek uh, repeatedly in this series because uh, his thoughts are important uh, on a number of areas. But but his main contributions to to macroeconomics. Uh, Let's start was, with that. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was that was before the before the war, the Second World War, and he was very influential uh, first in 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 Austria. Uh, where he 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 worked at that time, and then he was uh, invited to become a professor at the London School of Economics uh, as a, one of the most important uh, thinkers on 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 business side at this time. 
You are listening to Econ Roots, your podcast on the history of economic thought. Thank you for joining the conversation. If you want to understand what his business cycle theory is about, it's also about prices, but it's a different price than in the Keynesian story. Keynesian uh, or Keynes uh, were interested in the working of the of the of wages. So the labor market was important to understanding the business cycle in the Keynesian story. For Hayek, it was uh, the interest rate that was important, and the idea was that uh, you could, if you uh, influenced in a misleading way the uh, monetary policy, then you could send a, a wrong system through the uh, financial markets through the interest rate. And that would cause, um, so basically the idea is that if, if, if you increase uh, liquidity, then in the short run, it would look like there is a surplus of saving. Interest rates will go down. Um, firms will start investing in the long term. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they'll change the way they invest and the structure of their capital, as, as, as Hayek called it. So this wrong signal uh, would work for 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 a period of time, basically creating malinvestments. But since it was the wrong signal, it couldn't be maintained. So in the longer run, people realize that that uh, that they have had a long a wrong signal. A lot of the projects uh, they have invested in uh, will uh, not be feasible. Uh, and then you get the contraction, the crisis, boom so, and bust. Exactly. So really, in the in the Hayek story, the the most important part is understanding when the boom is happening. Yeah. That's where the uh, the the the, the uh, malinvestments are taking place, while the bust period really is a readjustment period. So you cannot avoid it. It's. Uh, to, to use um, maybe it's not a, a perfect picture uh, but uh, when you get sick you get a fever uh, it's it, you're not sick because of the fever, <laughs> <laughs> the fever you uh, have the yeah. fever because you're sick yeah. and it, it serves a purpose yeah. um, and so does the, the, the boss period so if you want to avoid um, business cycles uh, in, in the hike uh, in, in Hayek's model, if we can call it that, uh, you should uh, try to stabilize uh, liquidity. and should avoid sending this wrong signal. Keynes really didn't have a good explanation for for why uh, uh, the business cycle uh, happened. Mm. And uh, he, he really talked about a lot about the, what he called animal spirit. Mm. The idea that... Uh, uh, investors uh, would uh, suddenly change their minds and it would influence one another, and then you would suddenly see this change in mood, mood uh, which could 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 uh, account for, a, for 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 changes in investment. Whereas Hayek is quite clear that it's an external. Uh, it's a structural uh, thing. Yes, it's yeah. it's external ex- external signal. Um, so if you want to avoid the business cycle, if you want to avoid, for instance, a crisis like the, the, the Great Depression in the 1930s, where you, see, you saw a huge contraction of, of, the, of the monetary base in, in, uh, in both in, in, in US and, and in Europe as well. Um, and that was high, high explanation for, 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 for why we had the Great mm. the Depression. That was basically the, um, the the wrong monetary pol- policy. So, whereas Keynesians s- see politicians as sort of the doctors mm. you prescribe before, or <laughs> Keynes actually the 
compare the economist to dentist. So I knew if he, but an economist is like a dentist. If there's something wrong, you go and he fix it. Uh, he fixes it. So, um, whereas um, Hayek uh, saw the, the economist uh, as somebody who would tell people to brush their teeth uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and take care uh, because it's uh, it the, the reason for the business cycle is. Is, is the wrong policy in the first place. So it's... Uh... And and I think uh, so there's a very good explanation of it. I also think there's a lot of uncover here because if you're a little bit mean, especially to Keynes, because it wasn't his fault, but one of the reasons why politicians might be attracted to Keynes is that you can get all the great, all the votes out of doing these great things, short-term things for the economy. Whereas once the uh, the result that Hayek mentioned comes, you're probably not a politician anymore, or you can blame it on a million other things. And uh, and I think that's one of the issues here, right? Why they also might change in popularity, simply like pol- politicians just, uh, could get votes by building welfare states and Keynesian policy fitted really well with that. Yeah. And Hayek's didn't. Um, there's also another thing at play here that I always thought was interesting is because mm-hmm. once person a person like like uh, Samuelson um, uh, starts to formalize uh, uh, the Keynesian contribution even more, um, something happens with the capital idea, right? Because in many many economic model early Keynesian models not nowadays but early in Keynesian model the capital is homogeneous, right? Capital is just capital. Whereas one of Hayek's point is saying that can never be true. Like a factory to build cars cannot just build uh, baby toys or something like that. Like capital is very heterogeneous. Once you invest in something, you're stuck with it. It's, it is either impossible or very costly to change its application. And so if you move business concerns where we early on – in, the, in their concerns, so they start thinking very long-term investments. That has a huge negative com- complications down the line, right? The obvious examples that we see in many booms is that you build more office space, right? You know, and then all of a sudden, if, if it goes down, then you just have empty offices, and people can't live in offices. Not even that, right? I mean, they can't. They're not allowed to, but they also cannot. It's not nice to live in an office. There's not that many bathrooms and stuff like that. There's no kitchen, so or maybe just a small kitchen. Um, so I, I think that's also part of it, right? And uh, uh, and then there's the whole thing about modeling. I mean, Hayek does actually attempt to model a little bit. He has his triangle in his lectures. Uh, the lectures are interesting because I think Hayek is a prolific writer. I love reading his stuff. But actually what he got the Nobel Prize for, the, the lectures, they are horrible to read because they're just lecture notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but he, so he did actually try to model, but not in a mathematical sense. And um, he also was very skeptical about why, the, if that was even a good idea to do, right? The whole idea about incorporating ma- uh, math, right? Yes. I think what Hayek was very concerned about was that the idea that if you build a model, then you would also have enough uh, uh, knowledge of the system to control it. Mm-hmm. And he was that he was he was very uh, persistent in warning against the planned economy, yeah. and especially on that account, saying that what what you can do. That's, that basically, that's not not a problem with the model. Uh, the model is sort of a description. Mm-hmm. Uh, when uh, when Newton modeled uh, the solar system, he didn't do it in order to control it. No. <laughs> he did, <laughs> that's a good he did to understand <laughs> that's it. Good. Yeah, that's and good. And it was a, a very rough model, um, insufficient, uh, in, in fact, but it explained, at least at the time, it explained uh, how the solar system worked. And you could make some predictions uh, when the sun was going up in the morning and so on. Uh, it was clear from, from, from his model. Uh, but uh, so but that's understanding. Um, and of course, economists tried to do much more than that. The Keynesian tried to control the macroeconomy. Uh, socialist economists um, thought that they could uh, introduce an uh, entire planned economy. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, Hayek early on believed in so in socialism it was only when he was uh, introduced to Ludwig von Mises um, 
the great book on socialism that uh, that that he changed his mind and uh, Mises was also the inspiration for his business cycle theory. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Socialism Calculation theory. Debate, one yes, of the most sexy right. titles ever in intellectual history. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we uh, for the Danish listeners, we talk about that in season one as well. Um, it, but it is so. I guess what you're saying is that you can use models to describe, but not prescribe. Yes, right. Or, Maybe to uh, what would that model is. Yeah. It, it depends on what you're trying to do. The, yeah. the, the, the Keynesian could defend themselves saying that we're not trying to run the economy. Yeah. We're just trying to to determine if 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 there is insufficient uh, demand. Yeah. Um, but there is an important question. We're going to talk a lot about, about this in, in the next episodes mm-hmm. about uh, whether the, the government really has better information than individual citizens. Exactly. And uh, that is also, um, before we finish up on Hayek, that's also one of his main, later on is his life, like his his acceptance speech is also called the pretense of knowledge, right? He says, you have to be very careful about what you pretend to know, basically, uh, uh, which is also probably very true because, I mean, I would wish that I knew there was something called an iPhone 20 years ago. I think that would have made me a very rich man, <laughs> but I didn't. Right? And, uh, and uh, society is definitely a lot different now. Um, during the recent uh, COVID-19 lockdown, I, I often tell students when they visit us um, that uh, if that had happened 10 years earlier, they would have had to go down to Blockbuster and rent DVDs, but that would have been closed. Right, you know, now they could just stream Netflix, right? So, but that, you couldn't pretend that ten years ago. So, one last thing though that I just want to say about modeling and Hayek before we move on to Friedman is that uh, it is not impossible to model Hayek. Like, if you look, take because no, no. one of he was also a student of uh, Ergen von, von Bobek, uh, uh, the Austrian guy who was basically the father, the father of alternative costs and opportunity costs. And uh, and so that na- later on led within financial theory to stuff like um, net present value calculation, these things. I Before my PhD in economics, I had a, uh, a master of science in finance. And uh, and when you sit down and if you have an artificially set interest rate or a fake price on money and you do net present value calculations, projects seems profitable that are not profitable at other stages of that one, right? And that's actually very easy it's a very easy model to make, basically, right? But uh, so so it's not like you cannot model him, and uh, I think some people misunderstand that, right? So elements of at least his macro is very mo- is very easy to model, I think. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's cool. Not, not so, at all, not so at that, all in, in, impossible. Uh, you could say that you, you mentioned uh, Alfred Marshall before, yeah. the great British economist who which wrote, high quotes in, accept, yes. in his acceptance speech actually, and he 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 he. he he was a great teacher uh, until Sam Samuelson wrote his uh, his economic te- textbook. Uh, but he said, Marshall said, that you should start out doing economics in math. Then you should uh, tear up your math and uh, so then write it down uh, in in language. That is true. Um, and so that was very much the the approach uh, I think of his day. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Hayek really did model his his model so to speak <laughs> uh and and he should have done that yeah. I mean, he would he, he would it would he would it would work better for him if yeah. he if he had had known that tool but he it wasn't available no exactly uh, and and uh, it was very much thanks to samuelson that it became uh, available i think so too i mean it's uh, this technical uh, turn in economics, the as if turn or whatever you want to call it, uh, the par- Parisian term that has many names. Happens the technical evolution, so to speak, uh, happens very much due to Samuelson, very much after the Second World War, right? And and Hayek was of a different world. He was of a, the Vienna world of the salons and all that kind of stuff. And and even Marshall, he you know uh, he put all the math in the notes, right? Because he wanted lay people to read the book exactly. and understand it. And then technical economists and students could then like you know do the exams. And actually, when you go into a, to exams in Marshall back before, even before the Second World War, graduate exams would often be exams in the notes because of this, right? Because you know, so, so that's sort of like upside down. Uh, but anyway, let's move on to Friedman. Um, um, and um, so Milton Friedman has been called this, uh, the most influential economist of the second half of the 20th century. I think Keynes is the most uh, of the first and probably of the whole, but whatever. Um, 
he did not have an easy start to life. That would be uh, uh, he was born to Jewish working class immigrants from Hungary. Uh, he spent most of his childhood in New Jersey, which if American sitcoms or anything could go by is apparently a pretty bad place. <laughs> 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 so sorry to anybody from New Jersey listening to this, but this is uh, this is the image you're being portrayed. <laughs> Um, he had poor but supportive parents. Uh, he had to take care of his mother from a very young age because his father died. He himself was disfigured slightly in a car accident. So no easy way to life. When he actually started, uh, uh, when he actually started his academic career at the University of Wisconsin Madison, he left due to anti-Semitism because he argued for the U.S. to join the Second World War, and his colleagues didn't think that was worth spending American lives over. Um, However, seeing the America, uh, seeing the Great Depression, as you also said, turned him from pursuing a probably more lucrative career for most people in math or actuary science to actually do being coming an economist, which at that point was a fairly risky gamble. Like mm. the other two careers would probably have been more safe, so to speak. Um, he uh, after he um, after he actually retired, he also I think was the only economist who ever got a PBS special free to choose. <laughs> that was like <laughs> shown to everybody. Also. So uh, so he, he he was a great entertainer as well. And like we said, he had the weekly debate with Samuelson, uh, and people who met him always highlight how great of a teacher he was. And he got the prize in 1976. And do you have a reason for why you think it was 1976? It was uh, the 200th anniversary of the publication of The Wealth of the Nation by Adam Smith, which uh, was not only the birth of economics, considered the sort of birth certificate yeah. of economics. You discussed him in, yeah. in previous uh, uh, episodes, but listen to that. It's interesting. But... Um, He was also a uh, very, very an advocate of the the system of natural liberty, as he called yeah. it, the, the free society, free market economy, and um, so it was Milton Friedman. Yeah, true. So he got the prize, like we said, in 1976. The prize motivation was for his achievements in the field of consumption analysis, monetary history, and theory. Uh, and for his demonstration of the complexity of stabilization policy. That is a nice euphemism right there, by the <laughs> way, but that's, that's another thing. Um, so uh, um, in many ways, uh, Friedman proved some of Hayek's points, uh, but it was not an easy birth, so to speak, to get the prize. Uh, Murdale actually uh, was very critical of Friedman getting the prize, and some sources claim that he returned his prize. I don't think that's true. I haven't been able to confirm that. I just think he was very critical of him getting the prize. And when he received the prize, this very nice award ceremony with everybody wearing black tie and tuxedos and stuff, a left-wing activist actually jumped up mm. and shouted, Friedman, go home. Uh, and then the chairman of the proceeding in very cold Swedish humor simply said, I am very sorry for this incident. It could have been worse. I love that. There's a small clip on it on YouTube, which we'll link to in the show notes. So, uh, Friedman, uh, where to start here? Should we? Uh, should we? S let's talk about monetarism. Yes. The Keynesians um, and Samuelson believed that the the most important uh, reason for the for um, For, for the business side, it was insufficient demand. Friedman, early on, in actually he 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 he, he made a great uh, work together with a, a colleague Anna Swartz. Uh, he wrote a history, a mm -hmm. monetary history of the United States, and what he he showed was that there was a close relationship uh, between the the The, the quantity of money and the nominal GDP. So there were, these two were related. And the, so what you should watch when you look at the, the business cycle going up and down is for uh, changes in liquidity. He, is, mm -hmm. he agrees actually with with Hayek uh, and the saying that 
No, the, the, you have to understand the the um, the way the, the monetary system works in order to understand why uh, why we have business cycles. Basically, what 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 he he realizes, and he then goes on to make a very important discovery. Um, the discovery of the importance of expectations mm -hmm. in economics. And his criticism of Keynesianism very much crystallized in, a, in, in dealing with the Phillips curve. And basically the, the Phillips curve uh, showed that, uh, or, the, or the, the idea behind the Phillips curve was that uh, expectations really didn't change. So if you had inflation, you could have uh, real wages falling uh, simply by uh, what we call money illusion. Um, and the other way around, when, when if we have deflation um, and there is no change in the nominal weight rate, uh, of course, then, then you'll have uh, an inc increase in, in, in real wages. Friedman uh, said, why shouldn't people adjust their expectations? Um, uh, or adapt their expectations if they see that they, they don't come true. I mean, if if you see that your 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 real wages are falling, shouldn't you ad, uh, adapt mm -hmm. and uh, ask for for a higher pay mm -hmm. to compensate for inflation? That has some important uh, implications for the Phillips curves curve uh, if you had you adapt to inflation then the long run or you adapt in the long run then the Phillips curve uh, won't be a trade-off in the long run it will be vertical mm -hmm. so Friedman introduced the vertical Phillips curves saying that in the short run before in, in expectations have adapted then you can move along the the original Phillips curve, curve. Yeah. Uh, you can you can uh, if you uh, increase the, the the money supply then you can you can have uh, uh, an increase in inflation and uh, you will have a, an increase in employment as well until the wages uh, adjust. So, so that was very, very important, and that mean meant that expectations entered the scene and, and in, in macroeconomics, and that we're going to to discuss that 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 much more. But the the, the realization that the Phillips curve, um, as Phillips, he was sort of just discovering this relationship, and it was certainly there. In the short run, mm -hmm. but um, in the long run, it, it breaks down. And another, we, we should pay, perhaps uh, m mention that Friedman wasn't the only Nobel laureate to, to, to make this discovery. This was also discovered by Edmund Phelps, mm -hmm. who got the Nobel Prize in 2006, uh, uh, also for, for his criticism of the Phillips curve, of, uh, the simple Phillips curves. So what Friedman said was that you can, you can, you can, if uh, if you have high on unemployment, um, then you can you can you can you can reduce unemployment by easing the monetary policy, but only in the short run. In the long run, it will lead to inflation, and mm -hmm. you will employment will uh, will go back to the original level, what he called the natural rate right. of un unemployment. Yeah. So um, so you can't fool all of the people all of the time, as he said, <laughs> uh, by, uh, because we will adapt our expectations. So that was, that was, that was very important uh, in, in, in his contribution. He um, made other important uh, oh, yeah. contribution as well to, to macroeconomics, but that changed uh, 
Uh, you're right, Friedman was quite controversial. Um, he he was uh, at when when he got the, 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 the Nobel Prize, but but he got it in the mid seventies, and in the mid seventies it became quite apparent that uh, the the long run Phillips curve uh, was uh, like Friedman said was the, the the short run Phillips curves mechanism simply break broke down. You had what was called stagflation. <laughs> that was impossible to to contain within the Keynesian model at the time because you had both low low growth and high uh, high inflation. <laughs> and in the Keynesian model, you had to you had to choose. Yeah. Uh, but not in the Friedman model. Uh, so, so, so the the high inflation, low growth in the 1970s were also very important mm. for 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 Friedman's success and uh, as, as a macroeconomist. There's no doubt about it. I think uh, I think that's uh, there's some very interesting points here. I mean, uh, first of all. Uh, what you also said here towards the end that Friedman is probably one of the persons who got it the quickest after his first main contribution was sort of accepted, right? Like this, it's a period of basically five, seven years thereabouts, right? So if, and if since the committee have to work for a little while before, so it's about five years, right? Uh, which is impressive, and that might also testify to the to the to the times basically yes. right like the the big experiments with big expansive states has, had been going on they were failing fast like inflation was becoming a thing very quickly and and we see the uh, the turn with the uh, with conservative politicians in the 80s very shortly after um and he advised some of them but we'll get back to that in a little moment because i also think one of the reason why he was actually successful relatively early was that in many ways he spoke the same language as Samuelson, right? Friedman was a great writer. Uh, like if you read Right to Choose, he's, he's very easy to read. Everybody can read him. He put in uh, that he was like Marshall. He wanted layman to understand what he was saying, but he was definitely also capable of the technical stuff without a doubt, yes. right? Without a doubt. And in fact, he's uh, he's pioneered for the as if economist uh, idea, right? The idea that, yeah, we cannot find this perfect economic uh, utility maximizing equilibrium seeking uh, actor as a person out there but we can find like on aggregate levels where what is what macroeconomics is uh, there is people do behave like that right as a group they behave like that and he, I, he uses this idea of saying that it's sort of like the pool player the pool player doesn't calculate his strike but he behaves as if he does right and that's fine enough for economic analysis um, yeah Yes, and he, he, he contribu contributed to a lot of areas, and, and economic methodology was certainly one of them, as, yeah. as you mentioned. And, and he, he he made a great impression. Um, and his, his idea was that that the good theory should be able to predict, mm -hmm. rather than be very. Uh, uh, descriptions uh, or, or realistic in its assumptions yeah. so so it's it's allowed to 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 make an unrealistic assumption if it uh, if the theory makes predictions and even if we don't see as you mentioned we, we don't see uh many firms maximizing their profit the way the textbook suggests they should do but they they do in in practice yeah, because behave like if that. they think if they don't do that they'll be weeded out yeah. um, and you don't see uh, or you, you don't see a pool player uh, doing doing the the geometrics they uh, might not even be able to no quite they frankly probably wouldn't probably wouldn't probably be able wouldn't, to especially but, not if but, it's late at night and but, a couple of beers in and exactly, stuff like that but you you understand the the laws of Geometry, yeah. uh, nevertheless, yeah. and then physics, and are able to apply them, and you can describe what a pool player is doing yeah. by understanding uh, geometry. So, just like Samuels, and one of the legacies of Samuels was the idea that there was different schools within economics. I mean, he wasn't the first to suggest that with the historical school and the Austrian school and all that stuff, but he very much cemented it, I think, in the minds of the. Uh, like high school textbooks mm -hmm. and these kind of ideas and uh, and played along with that narrative. I think Friedman here is also important because he exactly highlights the difference between predictive power and uh, descriptive power in economics, which is another battleground, so to speak. I don't 
think the school debate is that interesting nowadays. I don't see a lot of... Of course, there's still schools and some people be, will adhere to them and others don't, but I, I don't think it's so important. But this discussion is still very important. Yes. The discussion about predictive or explanatory power. So we are running very late on time here. We're sorry, dear listeners, we're still getting the format right. So we're, I think we're going to end it soon. But we will, of course, just shortly need to comment on one thing because just like there's an Adam Smith problem. Well, there isn't, if you actually understand it, but for many people thought, thought there was an Adam Smith problem, the difference between moral sentiments and world, uh, the wealth of nations. Uh, you might argue that there's a Friedman problem, right? Because he's very hated on the left. It's always surprised me how hated he is on the left because he was actually fis- socially very liberal, right? He opposed the war on drugs. He thought his proudest moment was his battle against conscription. He uh, he advocated school choice, which helps a lot of poor people. But of course, he was also fiscally very conservative and he, uh, he played some part in helping Pinochet in Chile, which, you know, it's debatable, wow. but it's, it's there. I really... Well, I mean, you're a bit older than me, to be fair, Arto. I hope you don't mind me listening. So you lived through more of this. Is there a Friedman problem? Because he was both uh, liberal and conservative? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, well, I Friedman always describes himself as a libertarian, mm. uh, not a liberal. Yeah. Uh, because in, in a liberal in, in, in the U.S., means a socialist or a leftist and he wasn't uh, by no means by no means um, he would also declare himself a classical liberal mm. uh, in in perhaps most in, in Europe but 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 I think he was very consistent mm. he, if we're talking about his his mm. politics he was uh, and all of these economists we're talking about even if they have political leanings and and, and certainly they have Samuelson was quite left wing mm. uh, Cafeteria Fried- Keynesian, he called himself, I think. Friedman, oh. uh, Friedman certainly, certainly wasn't. Um, I don't think there's any inconsistencies in, in what he did. Um, he, he did uh, work uh, with Republican administrations, so he, he thought the Republicans were 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 the most uh, effective. Or um, he influenced uh, Ronald Reagan quite a bit. Uh, but actually, he was when. When Richard Nixon uh, introduced price and wage control, uh, which Friedman was uh, advising against, he criticized him very sharply, mm-hmm. very sharply. So he denounced basically uh, Nixon <laughs> much earlier than, than he he came into trouble for for other things. But uh, but he was he was quite critical of of Nixon's economic policies. So do you think it's more that he's just a picture? Because I sometimes feel this. In, in the first season, we discussed the idea of there being multiple Chicago schools, right? Like the left. sometimes on the left, you find people referring to the Chicago School of Economics. And if you know your history of economic thought, there's at least three, probably four, maybe more uh, Chicago Schools of Economics. Yes. Right? So is it just that he sort of became a picture of this, let's call it the conservative turn or the neoliberal turn or whatever after the welfare state or... Like, is it him or is it the idea of him? You think that's such a red flag to many many left wing people? Well, he was a very effective uh, debater. Oh yeah, uh, and he was together with Samuelson because they had this alternating uh, column in, in Newsweek, as you have mentioned. Yeah, uh, they were household names. So, oh yeah, uh, they were the first superstar economists, and and Friedman was very clear mm. in his advice. Mm. Um, so, of course, that made him a controversial uh, picture. Yeah. So, um, and but but he was but he was also very efficient uh, or effective as as a debater. Um, uh, George Schulz said said everybody likes to discuss. Milton Friedman, especially when he's not there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great thing to end on. <laughs> Thank you so much. So with that, we uh, we end today's conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and um, uh, until next time, where we continue with Modern Macro, I hope you you'll stay rational. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with us exploring the history of economic thought. You are welcome to email comments and suggestions to stefan at cpas.dk 
please like and share and recommend this podcast anywhere you can and think it's relevant. Until next time, stay rational. Yeah.